Below my feet, some of the most remarkable soil in the world. Chalk, but no ordinary chalk. Chalk made up of fossilised sea urchins. Put that together with seven centuries of history, a vintage car collection, and one of the finest prestige cuvées in the world, produced privately, we're going to Just meet Comte Audouin de today. Dompierre. I hope, I hope you will Comte Audouin de Dompierre, please show me your prestige cuvée de Dompierre. Sebastian, you see that this bottle is a good vintage, and it's Champagne de Grand Cru, and it's a Blanc de Blanc, prestige 98. And uh, of course, it's closed by a hemp twine. When the sommelier is able to open it in front of his customer, it stopped the conversation in the whole restaurant. But what is interesting is what is inside. And your family uh, coat of arms? And the coat of arms has been on the bottle since day one. We have had the same one since 1200. I'd like to start at the beginning of this extraordinary story 30 years ago. Um, what inspired you to make great champagne? Uh, I always decided to produce champagne with the good grapes because the good grapes make good champagne. The, the chemistry is something which is without any importance. The important is nature, where it comes from. And now, second secret of Champagne say, who makes the blending? Because the blending is the most important thing. If you know what you, if you have an idea, a precise idea of what you want to reach, you have a vague idea of how to, how to blend it. And, and to blend it, you've got to blend various villages. And even in the Blanc de Blanc, non-vintage, which I produce, I blend villages. And I decided 30 years ago to have three villages in the Côte des Blancs and three villages in the Grand Noir, in the just, just opposite of where, where, where we are. And, uh, and it, it's delicious. And the Cuvée des Ambassadeurs, which is absolutely unique because it's a blend of 50% Chardonnay and 50% Pinot Noir, and the Chardonnay is all Grand Cru, and the Pinot Noir is Grand Cru and Premier Cru. So in my Brut non-vintage, three quarter is Grand Cru, and this is rare. You were under the, a, a remarkable tutor when you started this process, the Chef de Cave you mentioned earlier. Tell us a bit about that process. Daniel Thibault was later recognised uh, as one of the leading Chef de Cave of his generation, if not the one, and he he didn't taught me how to make it. He taught me everything. He taught me where to get the, the grapes from. He taught me where to go and buy. He taught me how to blend properly. He taught me how to do that at the right temperature, etc. For all the little tricks of the, of the trade. And uh, he, he was fantastic because he told me, for once that I see one of those commercial people who get some interest in what he is doing, I'm going to teach you something. And so that's why we end up every Friday having a bottle of uh, champagne of uh, mysterious uh, extraction uh, together in his office. And, and for me this was priceless. What was the taste you had in mind when you were going to create a great champagne? I wanted to be a leader. I wanted to be the Aston Martin of champagne. I just wanted to be served in the nice places. And for this you should achieve a taste which is very recognizable by the people who drink it. It's called elegance. It's got to be elegant and easy to drink. If it is heavy and, uh, you know, you, you, you don't have the winner I wanted to have. Elegance is something. You should have body as well. Especially in England, people like to have a wine with body. And the body, you obtain it with age. That's this is the reason why I sell in the UK more vintage than anywhere else in the world. And uh, this is because the people who drink champagne, people who drink my champagne in the United Kingdom, they like it to be elegant and a little bit powerful. And I think it took me a few years, but I, we have achieved that. How is the assemblage put together? Do you, is there a group, of, a group of you that do that? How's that process work? Always with the same three persons. There is my chef de cave, cellar master. Always one, what I call one of the old guard, an old 
négociants from the terroir, a people who knows the village by heart, a people who has done that all his life. The third person is me. Sometimes I have a fourth one, but very rarely. We are three, we are three to discuss, and it's very, it's very emotional because it's, it, it's the result of what's going to be in 10 years' time. So, you know, once it's in the bottle, you cannot change anything, except the dosage, but, but it's the last thing. So sometimes it's a bit of a discussion, you know what I, what I mean. Your reputation with embassies is, is, is very well known. What was the starting point? What was the connection that got all that going? I had a, a very amusing story, which in fact launched the business in the embassy. We, we had a, a president de la République. Uh, his name was François Mitran. François Mitterrand uh, and me, we, are not in, we were not in the same family. And one day I received an extraordinary letter saying, Dear sir, I've liked your Grand Cru very much and ordered 60 magnums to be delivered to the house. And it was signed François Mitterrand, President de la République. And I thought it was a joke made by a friend of mine. I, thought, I had no idea who he was. So I picked up the phone and I, I called the Elysee Palace and I said, could I speak to Monsieur François Mitran, President de la République? And, and the man said, we, we are sorry, sir, he's in a meeting. I said, oh, OK, as if he's in a meeting. So give me somebody who, who, who run the, uh, the, the dinners. And I had the intendant, superintendent. And the intendant told me, yes, I have the copy of the letter, what I don't have is your prices. So I faxed the prices and it was honored of a confirmation. And I said, but I've never been invited to the presidential mansion. So I say it would, would be a good idea to have a look to see how it looks like, because it's my money who goes there. So I decided to deliver myself. And in order to deliver myself, I, I've chosen an old French car, a Delahaye 1947. And I delivered my 60 magnums myself in, in, in the main yard of the Elysee Palace. And that was fun because I had a private visit right after. <laughs> Tell us the story behind the creation of the family reserve. They all asked me to produce something for them. And I asked what they wanted. They wanted a Grand Cru, they wanted a Blanc de Blanc, they wanted a nice bottle, but not my fancy bottle. And they wanted a price which was a little more moderate than my my, my uh, prestige giving. And I decided to make this for them. And you know the family, they're always the same. They say they will buy, and in fact, when you send a letter, say the wine is ready, send the check, you receive the check for half of what they already <laughs> decided to buy. And so I was with 4,000 bottles, which is approximately 10 pallets. It was unknown by the, by the trade, so I didn't know what to do with it. And then I received my number one customer. He was the importing agent of the United States of America. And I served him the family, give, family reserve because I had gallons of it. And he said, oh, it's very good. I said, yes. I said, what is it? Because I don't know this champagne. He said, it's la reserve de la famille. It's the reserve of the family. I said, but I want it. I said, you, no, you don't understand. It's reserved for the family. And he said, but you know, by contract, you should give me what you have. So, yes, but this is not for you, it is for the family. And never underestimate the weight of the world, no. Because my no drove him potty. I thought he was, he was jumping on his, on his chairs and he wanted to have it. And at, at the end of the dinner, he told me, ah, oh, you know, if you, if you sell it to me, I would take 10 pallets, which was approximately what I had in reserve. I said, okay. <laughs> so I sold it and he went to San Francisco and it was an immediate success immediate success and since then I produce it every year and then I had a bit of a luck because you need luck you also need luck somebody uh, sent three bottles to the biggest wine magazine in the world called the wine spectator and this bottle with a vintage 1990 received 95 points which was unheard of for an unknown champagne Obviously, they liked it, and since then, it's booming. The Cuvée Prestige, which is currently 98, Dom Pierre, what was the inspiration behind it? And can we hear a bit of the history behind the Cuvée Prestige? My cellar master told me, I've got to talk to you. So he 
want to talk to me. So he never talk, he never say things like that. So say so, uh, you can talk to me. I'm in front of you. So, <laughs> and, uh, and he say I've bought grapes. I said, but you are paid to buy the grapes. He said, yes, but I bought grapes from, and he's, he mentioned few names, and I knew those people as being the most expensive grapes, of a seller of grapes in the whole Champagne, all from Avis, Cramont, Menil. The three villages I like best. Then we did the blending of what he bought. We decided to age it three years more than everybody, everything else, three years more than the normal um, vintage. And, uh, and then I decided it was too young, so we put, another, we put another two years. And then I had my prestige, or what I thought I was going to be my prestige. I had the idea to put it in a different bottle so that I could recognize it when I... And uh, at the end, it proved to be absolutely stunning and delicious. The, the bottle age period, give me an idea of what we're talking about. I mean, we're in the... Minim minimum is 10 years, and now we are on so 12, 13. So was released from 2008. Yes, yes. It's a champagne to be enjoyed before a good dinner. Yeah. It's champagne to be enjoyed with... A host you want to honor, and a champagne to be enjoyed with a lovely girl, because there's plenty in your country. And you could have the two bottles, the two of you, without feeling dizzy, very easily.